I think the statistics today talk about 609 million credit cards that are in existence just here in the U.S. When I hear those kind of numbers, I almost have to be apologetic. I grew up right out of the Depression, and I was just a very, very inquisitive kid, very inventive, coming up with all my own toys. By the time I turned 18, the Korean War was on, I was drafted, and after I came back from the service, people were making what they called charge purchases. They would come in with their credit card, which had an embossed number on it, and the merchant would have to look up that credit card number on a long list of negative account numbers that they were given every month by the credit card companies. Right around that time, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders came out, and I figured, I've got a great idea. If I could take a piece of tape and record the account number on that piece of tape, paste it on the back of the piece of plastic, and build a device that mimics a tape recorder, so that if I inserted the card and pulled it out rapidly, it could possibly work, and it did. And that was the invention of the magnetic tape on the back of the credit card. I was delighted when I saw all the problems it solved amongst all the department stores in which we installed it. Never made tons of money off the patent, but I made tons of money when I came up with lots more ideas and inventions with the development of the nutrition system to raise chickens in eight week period, the development of MLS, multiple listing service for the real estate industry, the development of voice response for the banking industry, which eventually took me into the New York Stock Exchange and I was there for over a quarter of a century developing things for the exchange. My nickname and what I'm known for is I'm the grandfather of possibilities and that's me. I'm presently 77 years old. If I had my life to live over again, I would want it to be exactly the same way. A good friend of mine always said, Ron, make sure you live life to the fullest, and when you go, make sure you go empty. The life of credit cards may be coming to an end at some point because we live in a world of obsolescence. However, we've had great longevity of the magnetic strip on the credit card. I don't say weird, but I am different. I'm a free thinker, and I just do my thing, and I don't worry about what people think. That's my plight in life. My name is Harvest, and I'm the Mindset Expert. Today we are joined by a very special guest. Mr. Ron Klein is an ordinary man who accomplishes extraordinary things. He's a problem solver. Every solution has resulted in monumental change, either in a new invention or in a simple solution. His innovative ideas have changed the world. He is an inventor of the magnetic strip on the credit card, the credit card validity checking system, and the developer of the computerized systems for real estate, otherwise known as MLS, which is the multiple listing services, and the voice response for banking industries, and bond quotation and trade information for the New York Stock Exchange. Ron's latest patent is a device that enables a visually impaired person's ability to identify an item when and physical range of that item. It utilizes a smartphone and specially coded adhesive labels. Ron is a strategic advisor, consultant, mentor to many, problem solver, and speaker. Ron, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Harris, and that was quite an intro. I, I really appreciate that, and thank you very much. I'm delighted to be on your show. Quite the career you have had. Wow, the magnetic strip. I mean, I don't even know where to start. How do you approach such a big project and uh, invention? You know, Adam, that was probably one of the simplest, simplest challenges and tasks I had in my entire career. Um, at the time, actually, what came before the magnetic strip was the first point-of-sale device. And the, uh, I always solve everything by looking at problems, not as problems, because problems can be can be announced as frustrations. I, I turn a problem into a challenge, and I identify the challenge by saying, what am, what's the issue? What am I working with? What do I have? And what's the goal I'm looking for? And I get rid of everything in between. That's just the journey. The minutiae in between is just the hurdles and the bumps in the road that you, you solve as you go along with stickability and flexibility. But if you identify every challenge as to what's the given and what's the solution you're looking for, it's fairly simple. 
So to answer your question with the magnetic strip, the first thing was the point of sale. The credit card companies would provide the merchants with a long list of all the negative account numbers every month in a form of a book. And the, the people would come in to make a purchase, and the purchase, all, all they had with this credit purchase was a piece of plastic with their name embossed on it and the card number, the actual account number. And the merchant would have to look up this, the numbers in that long list to see if a negative number was on that list. And if it wasn't on that list, then you were good to go. And that really built up a big queue. And around holiday time, it was a lot of, a lot of backup. And I looked at the problem and said, well, this is a challenge. All we have to do is just take all those negative account numbers, put it into some kind of memory system, and give the merchant a little keypad and he would key in the account number, and if it didn't come up in the memory system, the person was good to go. And that was really the first point of sale. It was very simple. And then I said, you know what? We really have to put some smarts in that piece of plastic. And right around that time, reel-to-reel tape recorders came out. So my innovative idea wasn't really an invention. It was an innovative idea. Why don't I just take a piece of that tape, cut it off, record the account number on that piece of tape, paste it on the back of the credit card, and then build a little device that mimics a tape recorder and make you the motor. You swipe it through. Or originally it was you push it in slow and pull it out rapidly. So it, it looked like you were a tape recorder. And that was the invention of the magnetic strip on the tape recorder. So it really was a very simple innovation, just applying some common sense. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it did. At the beginning of the interview, the little bio clip of you showed the old system for recording a credit card. You know, you have the credit card numbers with that big book, and you have to find that number in there. And, man, that would have taken a long time, especially I think of Black Friday. You know, people use their credit card in a matter of seconds. On Black Friday, you know, you have thousands upon thousands of people. I I can't imagine the amount of time that would have taken without your uh, magnetic strip. Absolutely, and and the, around Christmas time when you had such crowds, it would take so long for the merchant to look through that long list. And if you had an account number that chronologically was at the end of the list, just think of how, how what a, what a problem that was going through this long list. And the burden was on the merchant. So the solution I was looking for is to relieve the burden on the merchant. And what was given was negative account numbers that had to be checked. So it really was a simple solution. And just if you think, if you simplify it and use some common sense and logic, that's the way it gets done. And people say to me, well, geez, yeah, Ron, you know, you've got a technical background. You're an engineer. You had an engineering degree. It was easy for you. Well, my answer to that is if I didn't have the knowledge as to how to implement it, I would hire somebody that did. However, the patent ended up being 35 pages because it was a very involved (laughs) system and also a point of sale. But that's the approach. You know, simplify it and then take, take the challenge and find that opportunity. Wow. So when not just the magnetic strip, all the other inventions you created, can you just name, you know, one or two of the struggles or the biggest issues you had when creating some of these inventions? Well, you know, it's interesting. You, you, you called it a struggle or a situation. That's not – that's, remember, I, I talked about the journey in between when you have the given right. and what the solution is that you're looking for. That journey called the minutia, that's the education cycle because nothing comes out at the end what you thought it was going to be in the beginning. So all of these channels and all of these the challenges and these little hurdles that you stumble into are not problems. It's part of the education because when you do hit this stumbling block or this hurdle, you step back and you say, well, let me simplify this one. What is it that I need to move forward? So it's all part of the education. If we didn't have failures and if we didn't have problems, there would be no learning. So that's the answer to that question. Wow. So when, you, when you're creating something that hasn't been invented, uh, let's just start with, you know, let's go back to that magnetic strip or even the MLS system. You know, I, no one's invented it before. There isn't really a vision. You have a vision. Uh, but does that vision ever change from the beginning of the project to the end of the project? No, not really. You know, it all starts with an idea, and the idea has to turn into a benefit. You can't sell ideas. You can only sell benefits. So 
inventors are really innovators because I look at a, a task, I look at a situation, first we'll, we'll classify it as a problem, and then I turn it into a challenge and I say, how can I make it better? How can I provide a benefit? If I have a paper clip, what else can I come up with that will fasten paper together that's better? So what I look at is something novel, something that provides a benefit, and then go about coming up with the innovation to, to accomplish that task. So you really don't sell ideas. It's not frustrations. It's coming up with the benefit. And if you simplify it, every challenge provides a gift when you solve it. Okay. That makes sense. So I uh, originally met you at Secret Knock, which is an event held by Greg Reed, uh, but I initially heard of you about a year ago uh, just from a lot of our mutual friends. Uh, all the cool projects you get to have and all the cool inventions you've already invented, you know, I can't even imagine a world without all of your inventions. You know, going back to the one invention of the magnetic strip, I couldn't even imagine a world without that credit card magnetic strip. MLS, real estate would not be the same without, you know, the MLS system that you created. So your news project, we touched upon it a little while ago with the visually impaired. Can you just expand on that project and what benefit uh, the visually impaired will have from the uh, new invention you're coming up with? Sure. Um, again, I, I have a very close friend who happens to be visually impaired. He was blinded at a young age of 13 and a very accomplished person. In fact, he has his PhD and very accomplished. And I was having breakfast with him one morning, and I said to him, Jim, you know, we've, we've sat down, we've had meals together, and I've always wondered, what's on your wish list? And he said, you know, Ron, we're both – technically oriented, we both understand technology, and we know that you know if we can put men on the moon, we can do just about anything. He said, I wish there was something that would be very simple that wouldn't have an effect of the outside world coming to make major changes, but it would give me the ability of identifying the things that I come in contact with every day, or any blind person comes up with in every day, or even a visually impaired person with macular degeneration. And he said, there's got to be some simple solution that you can really come up with something extremely inexpensive with a new investment that it will satisfy that need. And I said, you know, that's a good subject. I said, let's finish breakfast and let me think about it for a little bit. Went home and, and two weeks later, I came up with this idea. And what it is, it's, a, it's an app in your smartphone, which is perfectly free to downline load. And then I have specially coded QR coded labels. Um, you've probably seen lots of QR code, code labels and lots of your listeners have too. It looks like a little postage stamp with a lot of little wiggly lines on it. And that's a two-dimensional code. And it can store URL uh, combinations and it can store some text that you can convert. And I took that basic concept and I, and I added some great features to it that can't be pirated and some great features to it that enable you to actually put voice on it, overlay voice on it, unlimited without changing the sensitivity. Because if you put too much density on that little QR code, it becomes very difficult to read. So the whole concept here is you buy a little package of 100 little labels, and I sell them in, in a package of 100. It's just about ready to be released. I've been developing it, and I have a company um, – in Europe that's actually building it for me. So you have this little package. It looks like a package of little sticky labels of QR codes, but they're special QR codes. It can only be read by my app. And you take one of those. The blind person takes one of those. Let's say if the blind person goes to a pharmacy and they're given a prescription. He'll take one of these labels, paste it on the top of the prescription bottle when he gets it, and ask the pharmacist, could you explain what this is? And as the pharmacist is explaining it, he pushes a button, just taps his smartphone, and speaks into the smartphone saying what it is. Now he takes that medicine bottle home, puts it into his medicine chest. Every time he opens up the medicine chest and points his phone at it, the camera in his phone reads that label and speaks back to him exactly what it is. The unique thing is, at any time, if he wants to change the message on that same label because it's programmable, the, the QR code is programmable on that little tape, he can actually say, now it's time to renew it or whatever. And there's just literally hundreds and hundreds of applications. Uh, I can go through many of them, and 
The inventor is really going to be the user who's saying, well, geez, you know, we can use it for this and that. The nice thing is it doesn't require a connection to the Internet, and it doesn't require any outside source of anything that would have to come in to affect the use of this. So it's just the, the cell phone and the little packet of labels satisfies the need. And it's very inexpensive because the app is free to download, and the, uh, the package of 100 labels that you can use over and over again with different programs and buy more, it's only less than $20 to buy a pack of 100 labels. What blind person wouldn't do that just for this opportunity? So my theory here is how can I help the visually impaired without having them to make a tremendous investment? So there's the answer, a long answer to that short question. <laughs> Now, educate me on this part. Can a visually impaired person do all of this on their own, meaning installing the app, put the labels on? Uh, would they be able to do all of it on their own, or are there parts that they would need someone um, that's not visually impaired to be able to assist them for just a part or two? No, in fact, it's very, very easy because uh, most, I would say, the greatest percentage of blind people today can't even read Braille code. It's interesting, or read the Braille because they haven't been cha trained in that, and it's passe. Um, the blind person takes their cell phone, <clears throat> and it's automatically, all their cell phones are capable of speaking today. They take that and push the button to download a new app. And that app is called, it happens to be called Eli. When they get that app, the app is all in voice, and it gives them instructions on how to use it. They tap once to do one function, tap twice to do another function, or tap three times to do another function. So they don't have to touch anything. They just tap, and the telephone tells them what to do. And then when they take this label and paste it on an unknown device, they take the label when they paste it on the, phone, on the unknown device because it's right off of this little sticky pad and it's very good adhesive. When they paste it on something, they keep their finger on it, and then they take their phone and put it on top of their finger and begin to move the phone away from it. As they move away from it six to eight inches, it beeps, captures the label, and tells them what to do. At that time, they now speak into the phone and say, this is my blood pressure medication. And it reads back and it says, that's fine. Is that what you wanted to say? Yes, you tap the phone. Then any time they point it in that general direction again, it reads. So it's very, very easy for the visually impaired person to use it. And the other one nice feature about it that's just an add-on feature is, let's say a child was born blind or a young child who wants to begin their education and the parent wants to introduce them to everything, all kinds of objects in the world. The parent takes one of these labels, puts it on an object, maybe it's a cup, and then records on that, from that label that this is a cup and now the blind child, who doesn't even know yet what things look like, anytime he comes in touch with anything that the parent sets up, it now continually repeats, this is a cup. He can feel it. This is a cup. So again, it just moves on, and he's educated as to what's out there, and he has a, a visual and audible explanation as to what it is. Does that answer wow. your question? Okay. Yeah, that does. That's really interesting. I the approach to that. Tell me if you've ever coded an app on your own, and if you haven't, how did you go about hiring someone um, that you know would do the do an excellent job? How do you go about hiring someone that can do the job for you? Well, well, like there's, a big task. Yeah, there, there's so many capable people out there today, and especially some of these young people who are who build apps are so knowledgeable. I could do quite a bit myself, but it's unnecessary because. I'm probably not the best at that now. Uh, at my age and years ago when I was trained and I have a degree in engineering and a degree in math, however, I've been an entrepreneur for many years and built large companies and had lots of employees. So along with my management skills and my knowledge and my technical skills, it's unnecessary for me to, to program an app. I write all the specifications. I develop everything analytically. And then I give it to those people that are capable of putting together the source code. So I understand the apps. I understand what's needed. I just have someone else implement it for me. Okay. That, that's interesting. Uh, I've tried to build apps 
working around it, trying to learn it, but everything takes time. Everything is a learning process. Correct. So tell me this. Do you have any – do you see anything in today's society uh, besides the visually impaired project that you're working on uh, that could use uh, either an invention or a new process or something like the magnetic credit card strip, taking something that already exists and making the process faster? Well, not just faster, but to improve it and provide benefit. Remember you, what I said earlier, you never sell ideas, you sell a benefit. And the answer to success, the answer to having anything being successful, is you have to be smart, daring, and different. Smart enough to have a knowledge of paying attention as to what is needed, what is the challenge, daring to be willing to take the risk, and hopefully you fail along the way because that's a learning curve, and different because now that's the benefit. That's going to be something that is novel and different that hasn't been corrected or built yet or enhanced. So I, come, uh, I do a lot of consulting for big companies and for individuals and, and small, medium-sized companies. So I'm confronted with all sorts of challenges on a daily basis in my career. I also do a lot of speaking, which you know of, and then I hold master with like-minded people, small groups of 10 to 15 people where they have challenges, I discuss their challenges, I paraphrase it, simplify it, and then tell them how to approach and how I would approach the challenge. But as far as things that are out there today that can use improvement, other than things like I explained for the visually impaired, absolutely. There are so many things out there, too numerous to talk about, however... <laughs> I'm working on many, many of them, and um, many of them will have great improvements and benefits. So, you know, without naming specifics, yes, there's lots to be done and a lots of improvements to be made. So can you tell us, if you, besides the visually impaired project you're working on, are there any other projects you can tell us about? Well, a lot of these are – I'm uh, I'm a member, a board member on many companies, and uh, – I'm supporting those companies, and, of course, all of that information is proprietary. But there's many, many interesting projects that I'm working on to support other companies. These are not projects for myself. The, the one for the visually impaired, that's something that I did for myself. However, I, uh, I assisted the company that I have preparing and making and developing it for me, which they completed, and all I did was took a license back for myself so that I have the entire worldwide marketing rights. But all of the other companies that I either support or I'm a board member on, they're working on very, very interesting projects. Each and every one of them are different. I, <clears throat> I help attorneys. I help um, doctors and lawyers and engineers and business, big business people along with their innovative ideas and show them the simple way to make these things beneficial to the rest of the world. So, yes, I'm working on lots of projects, but I can't disclose each and every one of them. Some of them are in the securities industry. I will say that. Correcting some of the problems that people are putting in now with fraudulent capabilities. Yeah, you told you spoke of one a little bit at Secret Knock, and I'm excited to see that technology emerge. Now, your nickname is the grandfather of possibilities. How right. did that nickname... How did that nickname start? Uh, it's no surprise you have it, uh, but how did it? What, what are the origins of that nickname? Okay, that's an interesting story. First of all, I have to say one: uh, I failed at retirement three times. The first time I said I was going to retire, I was only 34 years old. I had sold a public company that had 125 employees, and after I retired, and it was three months. I figured this is not for a 34-year-old young man. I've got to get back out there and go to work. So that retirement didn't last too long. The second retirement, I, I <laughs> stayed in well into my 60s, and when I thought I was going to retire again, it wasn't. I said, I'm not empty yet, and it's time to give back to the world. So I'm very busy working, uh, and I'm going on 80 years old. So And I'm still active. I'm physically very active, too. I'm a senior Olympian and I ride a bicycle 35 miles a day. But um, your, your question about how did I pick up the name, the, the grandfather of possibilities. Yep. One day when I finally went to go back and, and start giving again to the world, 
I was invited by a, a major speaker out to dinner in New Orleans. And uh, in fact, his name was Willie Jolly. And he read about me, heard about me, and he said, I've got to have you out to dinner and talk to you. And while we were having dinner, his wife, Dee, she said, Ron, were, were your parents inventive? Were they creative? And I said, no, I came from a very, very plain, you know, working class family. My dad was a postal worker. And my mom worked in a department store selling coats. I said, but my grandfather, my, my mother's father, was a very famous inventor. And he was my mentor. I hung around with him all the time. In fact, he invented the first steam propulsion uh, system for ships, for uh, freighters. And he also invented a, torp a torpedo detector for submarines during the First World War. He invented the pressing machine for tailors. He invented, he was a diamond cutter. Um, he invented the rabbit ears for television when it first came out for the antenna. And he was just so creative. He even taught me how to sew. And I just, I love this guy so, and spent a lot of time with him. In fact, he was, uh, he passed away when I was 16 years old, and I happened to be visiting him in the hospital, and he, he died in my arms. Very, very emotional period in my life. And Dee turned around and said to me, she said, God, he, you're, you're like your grandfather. She said, he had such possibilities, and you're like the grandfather who had your possibilities. And I said, wow, what a great name for a book. Mm -hmm. I'm the grandfather for possibilities. And my wife, who's an author, wrote my biography. So that's how the name, The Grandfather of Possibilities, came about, and I trademarked it. Wow. <laughs> that's an awesome, awesome story. Now, Ron, serious question here. Do you know that there's only 24 hours a day? You said you just ride a bike every single day for 35 miles. You help many, many businesses with many different projects. You're doing this visually impaired project. I mean, how do you get it all done in 24 hours? Well, I go to sleep with my cell phone right next to me, and I'm constantly coming up with ideas. And every time I come up with an idea, I push it on, record that message, and I'm already ready. Um, I only require maybe about five hours of sleep, and um, I just have a lot of energy. You know, years ago they used to say, if you stand still, they throw dirt on you. So I'm afraid to stand still. <laughs> very, very true. And... I can't lie, you had some of the best dancing moves at Secret Knock when they started playing the music. I couldn't even keep up. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, I still have rhythm. I happen to be a musician, too. I started playing <laughs> guitar. I started playing the guitar at age six, and I play the guitar, the upright bass, the tenor banjo, and lots of different stringed instruments, and I'm still playing. In fact, when I was young, um, in high school, and then into my, after I came out of the service, I played in a band and even cut a record. So uh, that's also one of my interests, uh, music. So I guess I have rhythm. <laughs> well, I don't. <laughs> so tell me this, Ron. Give us a secret sauce to this. You have several inventions that lasted several decades. Can you give us a secret sauce of making an invention that lasts that long? Well, um, here's one of the secret sauces that I have. Well, first of all, it has to provide a benefit. You don't sell ideas, you sell benefits. And let's, let's take a quick look back at the credit card. When I came up with that concept and that idea, the, and that was uh, in 1966, the reason it has survived all these years is it doesn't require energy. It's a magnetic strip that doesn't require energy. It was magnetized with information. And if it doesn't require energy, it doesn't radiate. And I figured if I want something that has some degree of longevity, why don't I do something that has information, doesn't require energy, and has great longevity because it doesn't radiate so it can't be pirated. The problem was never at the point of sale. The problem of fraudulent transactions is after the point of sale, the man in the middle and the server. So there's an example of uh, stickability with a product. Huh. Wow. That, I mean, just thinking that all of your products, or most of them, all your inventions, outlasted so much, you, you know, your credit card strip, the Internet, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Internet wasn't even out, and now 
we've evolved so much online, and everything has, you know, your inventions have stayed constant throughout all of uh, the universe evolving, basically. Yeah, in fact, the memory system that I used when I came up with the magnetic strip and the point of sale was there were no, there was no internet at the time, there were no PCs, and the rapid, uh, the rapid memory devices were called magnetic drums. They were actually a drum that rotated at a high speed, and it had magnetic heads, so it was multiple heads on this big magnetic drum that looked like a gigantic recorder, and the drum would spin centrifugally, and you could access data on that drum in milliseconds. And for your listening audience, milliseconds then was like a snap of a finger. Now we talk about nanoseconds and micro nanoseconds. So that's how you would access it. Long-term storage was the reel-to-reel tape recorders that was was relatively slow. So that's how we stored all of the negative account numbers on magnetic drums that were accessible in milliseconds, fractions of seconds, and we would access them with little keypads. And that's why it lasted so long. And then, of course, I put the intelligence into the, the credit card itself by putting a magnetic strip on it. So I used that methodology and that that uh, ideology in, in a lot of my things, including multiple listing service, and that's a whole long discussion in itself of why that's been out there so long. I developed that in 1967. So there's another perfect example of as it grew and it was enhanced, and there were lots of enhancements, but I had many enhancements at the time that I developed it. It's there to provide a benefit, and that's its function. So tell me this, when you were first starting, did you have a mentor? Who were they and how did they uh, keep you on track with all of these inventions? Well, my mentor and who gave me really the, the inspiration to develop and, and it made me very inquisitive was my grandfather who was the inventor. But prior to that, when I was a young boy, um, I, was old, I grew up during the Depression years and of course there was no money. So I didn't have money to even buy toys. If I was lucky, maybe once a week or once every few weeks, I would get 10 cents to go to the model store, the hobby store, and buy a a balsa wood model that I could put together, a rubber band powered airplane. But other than that, I had to make all my own toys. And I used shirt cardboard. That was the cardboard that they used to put into the shirts when they were cleaned and masking tape. And I would build all sorts of interesting things. And I even built motors and all all kinds of things. Very, very interested in that all through my growing up young years. And then um, I actually trained as a commercial artist because when I was going to uh, junior high school, I had very uh, great artistic talents. And the teachers encouraged me to go on. So I actually went to a vocational school to study commercial art and then went on to a museum school to perfect it. And by that time, I had graduated, and I was getting close to 18 years old, and the Korean War was on, and I was drafted. When I came back, my true love was to really get involved in engineering and really develop. And uh, on the GI Bill, I was able to have enough money to go to college and get my engineering degree and my math degree. So that, that was the start of my career. And then ended up being a, a chief engineer and a development engineer for some large corporations. So tell me this. How does a young entrepreneur find a good mentor? Call me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're out there. There's lots of good people out there that will really give some good guidance. And the, the one thing that I feel is so important is to establish a line of communications it's very easy to complicate things, and that's why I say simplify. If I would try to explain something to you, somebody that wasn't technical, I would make sure that I would find out what it is that they were familiar with that could resemble somewhat what I'm trying to tell them that is a little technical and establish that line of communications so that they look at it and say, I get it. I'm on the same page. And that's what's so important. It's very easy to snow people with a lot of mumbo-jumbo and and fancy words. It's not that easy to communicate with someone, simplify it so they say, I get it. 
And that's my expertise of paraphrasing things. Einstein said many years ago, if you can't explain something in one sentence or less, then you really don't understand it yourself. And that's how you find a good mentor. So tell me this as well. How do you handle negative people uh, telling you, you know, your ideas are never going to work? Um, unfortunately, those things do come into play when you're inventing something brand new. Simple answer. I don't allow negative people in my life. That is a very simple answer. <laughs> yep. So my last question for you today, and thank you for taking the time to do the interview. Uh, what is the single best piece of advice you can give to the young entrepreneur, maybe in college or high school, starting a business? Most important is to learn something new every day. Be aware. Even if you think it's nebulous information, it's not it's not applicable to anything that you're interested in, you've got to be interested in everything because somewhere, somehow, everything that's out there and surrounding you and everything that's spoken, whether it be through the news or whether it be through listening to people and learning, and most important, everybody hears, but most everybody hears, but not everybody listens. If you listen and learn something new every day, that's the way you can develop entrepreneurial talents. And that's the best piece of advice I can give to anyone. And most important, never forget those three words that I said to be successful. Be smart, be daring, and be different. Awesome. And then, Ron, your wife also developed, Arlene developed a book for you. Uh, What is the name of that book and where can we get it? Well, it's called The Grandfather of Possibilities. It's available on uh, Amazon. You can even order it at Barnes & Noble. You can go to my website and order it on the website or just email me and say you'd like a signed copy, and I'd be only too happy to give a signed copy. I have to say she did a magnificent job. It's pretty much all about my career, what I've done from childhood all the way up to present day, and I, it's a it's a quick read. It's only 100 pages. You can read it in an hour uh, or less. And uh, I think it's worthwhile really using that as a guide to getting yourself started. So, again, it's called The Grandfather of Possibilities. My website is www.thegrandfatherofpossibilities.com, or you can also access it by www.4, that's the number 4, Ron Klein. Dot com. That's R-O-N-K-L-E-I-N. Awesome. Well, I have my copy, and I'm going to start reading it. And thank you so much for signing it. Thank you so much for doing the interview. Uh, if you have any lasting thoughts, go ahead and give them out now. But otherwise, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and giving us this amazing interview. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure, Harrison, and I hope your audience enjoys it. All right, so 